Give me ten seconds. Written and read by John Sargent. You're going to be famous. A rival television correspondent was suddenly rather cross. You're going to be famous for making a bloody mistake. It was difficult to take in what he was saying. We were caught up in a crowd of technicians and producers. Some of them gave every impression of knowing what to do. Young men and women carrying clipboards with an earnest air. But as usual, when I have been covering great events, I was not so sure. I was trying not to look bewildered. What we all required was time to reflect, not on how famous I might become, but about what we should do next. It was a cold November evening. The courtyard of the British Embassy in Paris resembled a film set. The short rise of steps leading grandly to the entrance seemed to turn the courtyard into a stage, and the television arc lights lit up the scene with a clinical glare. A large group of newspaper journalists had been placed, to their annoyance, as far as possible from the steps, behind the sort of crash barriers used to control crowds at football matches. But not all the television correspondents, close to the bottom of the steps, considered themselves fortunate. The real drama, broadcast live to millions of homes, involved only a small number of players, and now it was over. My rival continued to shake his head and to contemplate the awful thought that I might become a celebrity. It was all so dreadfully unfair. He had been there. He had asked Margaret Thatcher a question. I had clearly been out of my depth, even made to look a complete fool. But he feared I would be judged to have scooped the story from under his nose. I have many reasons to look back on that evening in 1990. And bless my good fortune! It would have been exciting enough simply to hear Mrs. Thatcher's reaction to the fact that she had failed to win the first round in the Conservative leadership contest. But that was coupled with a wonderful pantomime scene, with me not knowing she was behind me, and then appearing to be manhandled aside by members of her staff. For many people, this was the moment when they realised that the Thatcher era was over. Two days later, she resigned. After eleven years, as one of the most dominant prime ministers in history, on frequent occasions I would be asked to look again at what happened. I even had to endure the embarrassment of seeing an actor play me in a television drama reconstructing the events of that night. It reminded me of a joke in Tom Stoppard's play *Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead*. An Elizabethan playwright decides that there should be a real hanging in his play. A man should actually die, but after trying it once, he dropped the idea. It was not convincing enough. I felt the same about this chap dressed up as me. He wore the sort of fawn cavalry twill coat I wore on that occasion, but to my eyes, he could hardly have been less like me. He should have been strung up. We had known for weeks that a big story was brewing. Mrs. Thatcher's hold on power was finally looking shaky. She had held office with such confidence and determination that even the more cynical journalists found it difficult to speculate that she might soon be gone. She seemed invulnerable. She blatantly traded on the assumption that no one of right mind would want to remove her, and like in a Greek tragedy, that was one of the causes of her downfall. It was a fatal flaw. A fortnight before the prime minister left for Paris. She ordained that the result of the first round in any leadership contest would come while she was in France. This was a tactical mistake. She had no idea that every vote would count, and that, as it turned out, with four more, she could have won the first round and perhaps been able to hold on to the premiership. As her supporters bitterly reflected afterwards, if she had stayed in London, she might have been able to sway those votes at the last moment. I had followed her career closely ever since she had beaten Edward Heath in an earlier leadership contest. She was irritating, bossy, single-minded, obsessive, illiberal, and aloof. But I liked her. When she came into a room, it seemed as if the walls had to expand to include her personality. I deliberately set off for Paris with a fairly heavy heart. It's a defence mechanism.
If you are in no doubt that you are on a major story and success is assured, it frequently ends in disappointment. It's better to start with low expectations. It gives you far more room for surprise and excitement when the time comes. At Westminster, meanwhile, the tension was rising. For most of the day, Tory MPs had been traipsing along the vast committee corridor, stretching right along the back of the building, facing the River Thames. The ballot was due to close at 6pm, the start of the BBC six o'clock news. It had been decided to extend the programme beyond its normal finishing time to give, it was hoped, the response of Mrs Thatcher from Paris. When the result was read out, there was an instant and knowing reaction. Second ballot was the comment, quickly and endlessly repeated. For Mrs Thatcher's close supporters, it sounded like the tolling of a bell. When I heard the result in Paris, I was in no doubt that she was in very deep trouble. More than 150 MPs had turned their backs on their leader. I cannot claim to have been certain that she would have to resign, but I did think it was likely, and this led me to make the mistake that would make me famous. One of Mrs Thatcher's staff was an official seconded from the Foreign Office, Peter Bean. Standing in the courtyard of the British Embassy, the arc lights upon me, I was trying to assess what was happening. I felt sure that Mrs Thatcher would want to consider the result of the ballot to confer with her colleagues in London. I put this thought to Peter, and he concurred. I told the 13 million people who were watching the broadcast, as firmly as I could, that Mrs Thatcher was not expected to come out for half an hour. Television correspondents are kept in touch with the news studio by devices which look like hearing aids. You are frequently given a stream of details oddly irrelevant to the task in hand. On this occasion, for once no one was saying anything in my ear. The only voice I heard was my own saying that Mrs Thatcher wouldn't be coming out. There was an eerie silence which seemed to go on and on. And then a photographer leapt up in the air, describing a sort of arc in front of my face. At home, 13 million people knew exactly what was happening. They were watching a pantomime. Mrs Thatcher had appeared behind me on the steps of the embassy with her two aides. They were bearing down on me at speed. The newsreader, Peter Sisson, shouted, John, she's behind you. I knew nothing. I heard nothing. The magic earpiece had failed. Turning round is always dangerous on live television if you don't know what or who is behind you. Something, perhaps it was the photographer and his elegant leap, prompted me to swivel. I was horrified at what I saw. The Prime Minister and her closest aides, intent it seemed, on confronting me. I desperately tried to recover my poise. M Mrs Thatcher, I spluttered, trying to make it sound like the beginning of a question. And then came a wonderful moment of farce. Bernard Ingham and Peter Bean pushed me roughly aside and shouted, Where is the microphone? I could not understand why they thought it mattered where the microphone was. Surely if that was anyone's problem, it was mine. However, the microphone they were looking for had nothing to do with me. It had been decided that she should give her reaction to the waiting press, all the waiting press, and not just me. A microphone had been set up on a stand in front of the print journalists who had been corralled at the bottom of the courtyard. But the principal actors had no idea where that microphone was. They were reluctantly forced to use the only microphone they could see which was the small blue one resting in my hand. I had no intention of budging. This was a BBC exclusive, and I had the distinct advantage over Mrs Thatcher and her aides, knowing that this whole event was being broadcast live. Many of the audience at home, particularly the most senior members of the government, drew an obvious conclusion from this farce. Mrs Thatcher appeared to have already lost her grip on government. The transcript of this bizarre event does not do justice to the drama. John Sargent. Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher, it's here. This is the microphone. Prime Minister. I'm naturally very pleased that I got more than half the parliamentary party and disappointed that it's not quite enough to win on the first ballot. So I confirm it is my intention 
to let my name go forward for the second ballot. There have been so many comments on what was sometimes referred to as the occasion when I was handbagged by Mrs. Thatcher that perhaps I should lay to rest some of the wilder assertions. She did not herself manhandle me. She was not reacting in a fit of rage when she saw me on television saying she would stay inside the embassy. She was not watching television. When the result came, her parliamentary private secretary, Peter Morrison, wrote down the figures, passed them to her, and said, Not quite as good as we had hoped. Mrs. Thatcher is said to have reacted coolly. She left almost immediately and confronted me in the courtyard. For the nine o'clock news, we had more material. The Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd, had declared his support for Mrs. Thatcher, along with the Chancellor, John Major. Then, for the first time, I had the opportunity to see what had happened when I had failed to notice Mrs. Thatcher behind me. As I watched the pictures through the window of the editing van, I was so apprehensive that I closed one eye. It looked good enough for me to try with both eyes. What made this a significant piece of television was that it appeared to tell a larger truth. Like a political cartoon, the caricature that had been created of a Prime Minister who had lost touch, and with officials appearing to have lost their manners as well as their sense of direction, was devastatingly accurate. Over the years, I've witnessed many important events, but the most satisfying, the funniest, and certainly the most memorable occurred during my two-day trip to Paris in the late autumn of 1990. And all I really said was, here is the microphone. There is a long tradition in my family of being present at historic events. Often we have no intention of being there. It is a result of outside forces. In my professional life, this role has frequently been played by editors, saying in a fairly bossy way, I think we should send Sergeant. Whatever the reason, we have found ourselves in the thick of violent, unpredictable events which had a curious way of ending up in the history books. From my grandfather's home in the Russian port of Odessa on the Black Sea, he could look down on the Grand Harbour and keep a close eye on the Imperial fleet. Horatio William Cook had been born in Odessa and spoke fluent Russian. As well as being able to observe the Imperial fleet, he could also keep an eye on the family warehouse alongside the dock. His grandfather, who had come from Lincoln, set up business in Russia, importing farm machinery from England. But in 1905, the easy pickings of those early years in the Russian market had given way to anxiety about political unrest and fears that the Tsarist regime was being fatally undermined. One of the historic clashes took place in Odessa. The great Soviet film director Eisenstein turned it into a famous propaganda epic, the battleship Potemkin, and my grandfather saw much of what happened from the family home, a short distance away on the top of a cliff. By dawn, 2,000 people had been killed. Later, the First World War had a curiously dramatic effect on our family. We were caught, very luckily as it turned out, by a wartime regulation. It caused my parents to trek across Russia and avoid, by only a couple of months, the Russian Revolution. The regulation stated that although the first child born abroad could be born British, the second born could not, and in the summer of 1917 my grandmother was pregnant. My mother was British by birth, but my Aunt Tanya had to be born in England to have British nationality. By this simple twist, the family came to London not as frightened refugees, but in response to the long arm of officialdom. It was difficult for me to escape the conclusion that in many ways, as a family, we were odd and different. When I was at school, there was a girl who had ascertained that I was called John, my brother Peter, and my sister Anne. Do your parents, she said, have very odd names? Well, maybe, my voice dropped to a whisper. My mother is called Olive Horatia Sargent, and my father is Ernest Noel Copeland Sargent. So there, she said, giving a very good impression of that ghastly girl in the Just William stories, Violet Elizabeth Bott. But secretly, I was rather impressed. 
Girls, I decided, would have to be taken far more seriously than I'd imagined. They seemed to know about families, about names, about relationships. My father was certainly not an expert in this field when he knelt down to pray one evening in the summer of 1936. He was 25 years old, and he prayed for a wife. He took prayer seriously, as you might expect from a young curate. He was, though it has to be said, a rather unusual young curate. He had two degrees from the University of Oxford, and he had developed a remarkable skill in foreign languages. Ernest Sargent had been marked out from an early age as something close to a prodigy. His parents were so worried about his lack of friends that they bought him a monkey. At Lincoln College in Oxford, he studied theology and was disappointed that the examiners awarded him a second-class degree. He decided that he would now make a serious effort to master Russian in just two years. He was awarded a first-class degree with a distinction in the oral. In the long years he knew my mother, she never remembers him ever making a mistake in Russian, although he frequently corrected her. When we were children, it was their secret language. Whenever they spoke it, we knew they were discussing us. But his brilliance at languages, he would eventually master more than thirty, did not provide him with the means of support, so he decided to become a clergyman in the Church of England. My mother believes that when he prayed for a wife, he was really hoping for someone from a difficult language group, perhaps someone from the Basque region. But when you're keen for a wife, you can't be too choosy. And there was the young woman he'd met briefly at the School of Slavonic Studies. Within six weeks, they were engaged. I would like to say that this was a perfect match. With her drive and his brains, she thought at the very least he would end up as a bishop. But in 1943, after six years together, there were signs of considerable strain. There were two children already, and my mother was keen to have a third. She would later describe this as her response to Adolf Hitler, although there was also, she insisted, a completely different explanation. My mother was very cross at the haphazard way my father had planted some cabbages. Far too close together, she recalled years later. I realised that I could not count on him to help and I should therefore hurry up and have another child. It was as a result of these diverse events that I was given the chance of life. On the 14th of April, 1944, I was born in the Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. The Reverend Ian C. Sargent was a romantic, and he was troubled that his relatively easy wartime life might be seen as unmanly. He could not easily explain to strangers that, as a clergyman, he was in a reserved occupation, and that he suffered badly from piles. When the war was over, he decided that the time had come for him to brave shot and shell. He set his heart on becoming a Christian missionary in the Middle East. At their headquarters in London, he told the organisers of the mission to Palestine that he could learn languages, any languages. Arabic, they said firmly, and off he went, no doubt with a spring in his step. For my father, taking on a new language was like taking on a mistress, except that it was far easier to understand, and there was never a shortage of supply. Jerusalem was about to be torn apart by civil war. It was January 1946. The Jews and Arabs were fighting over whether there should be a state of Israel. Almost every evening, in the five months we were there, we could hear the noise of gunfire. A young airman was murdered outside our home. The British authorities decided that families should be evacuated. My father stayed, but we were sent home. Whenever I see the film The Railway Children, I think back to that time. Our father was not in prison, but he would fail to return for another two years. My mother found a job as an assistant matron in a small private school at Swimbridge in North Devon. When my father eventually returned, it was not to marital bliss. In Jerusalem, He'd fallen in love with an Armenian nurse. On his first night back, he joined me in my bed as I slept. We were staying in a tiny flat in Kensington. My mother's bed had been deemed unsuitable. It was one of my first real memories, waking up with this strange and wonderful person beside me. I knew nothing of the tension between him and my mother, and only when I was grown up was I told about Azaduki, the Armenian nurse who'd followed him to England.
The affair soon ran out of steam, and my parents were faced with a cruel dilemma. How could they bring up the children they adored when their marriage seemed to be over? They reached an extraordinary agreement. For the sake of the children, they would stay together for ten years, and then they would both be free to marry again. It meant that I lived in a traditional family setting with a father and a mother, a brother and a sister. We went on holidays together. We always shared meal times. Although there were times when my parents quarrelled, I had a happy childhood. For me, it was far better than if they'd split up. The precious years of my childhood were protected. We left London for an 18th-century vicarage in one of the most beautiful villages in England. Great Tew in Oxfordshire is largely unspoilt today, with its golden sandstone walls, Norman church, and the grand manor house on the hill. The Reverend E. N. C. Sargent became the vicar of Great Tew, and my mother would play a role she surprisingly relished, that of vicar's wife. The village was heaven for children who want to build igloos in the winter, to ride bicycles in the summer, to chase bullocks in the field. We hardly needed to read the Just William stories. We were those child characters, anarchic and unafraid. I had the great advantage of being the youngest. When we brought out my mother's terrible temper, I would sometimes literally hide behind my brother Peter. The disadvantage was that I usually wanted to take bigger risks and was often more upset when things went wrong. Our escape from home was a case in point. I was about six at the time. And could see no reason why we should not make a break for it. We had been cooped up for long enough, and could do with a great adventure. My brother and sister were not so keen, but we picked up a loaf of bread and clambered over the high wall enclosing the estate belonging to the squire of Great Tew. When we could not think of anything better to do, we would always climb a tree. No decision had to be made. The tree climb itself was reason enough. So we sat in the tree, wondering what to do next as the afternoon wore on. It's not exactly clear how it happened, but to my horror, Peter relieved himself on the loaf of bread. It was immediately obvious that with our food supplies ruined, we could not run away from home. I felt cheated as we wandered back to the vicarage, and was particularly annoyed when it became apparent that our mother had not even missed us. It may seem strange, but we were not a religious family. The Reverend E. N. C. Sergeant had enough doubts himself to be careful about taking too strong a line with us. He did stress, though, that it was our family business. Other children were given permission to leave church before the sermon began, but we were not. In later life, I was not a church goer. Sometimes, frivolously suggesting that my church attendance as a child should see me through. What the experience did teach us was the importance of acting properly in public, not because it was inherently good, but because it could hurt your family if you let them down. Worldly affairs had little effect on my life at Great Tew. We did not have a television set. My parents believed it was better for us to talk and read, but we were allowed to see the boat race in 1951, and in 1953 we saw the coronation on television. It was at about this time I decided. That I wanted to be a comedian. Maybe this was because the world of grown-ups often seemed easier to appreciate as comedy. The professional comedians I enjoyed most were on the radio: Tony Hancock, of course, but all the others of that time: Ted Ray, Arthur Askey, and Jimmy Edwards, among them. When the Goon Show became all the rage, I could not understand why everyone did not want to be a comedian. How else could one cope with? All those self-serving reminiscences of the Second World War, without thinking of Spike Milligan shouting at the generals, "The war is over. Get to your typewriters." At Great Two Primary School, the teacher, Mrs. Berry, must have had something special. I was there from the age of five, and when I left, in large measure due to her skills, I was one of the best eleven-plus candidates in the county. My father, as well as being the vicar, was a teacher at a minor public school. At Bloxham, and when I was eleven, I went there to join my brother as a boarder. Because my father was on the staff, the fees were limited to a hundred pounds a year. My idyllic life in Great Tew came to an end in 
the decline in the power of the Church of England had not altered the demands which some wealthy patrons were determined to place on their vicars. Led by a woman called Lady Hunter, a head of steam was built up against my father. Through her contacts at Bloxham, she had him dismissed from the school on the grounds that he was neglecting his parish. Without his teaching salary, we had insufficient funds, and so we left the village. As it turned out, it was also the end of my parents' marriage. Their ten-year agreement was almost up. We three children moved with my mother to Oxford into the first property we owned. My father went to teach at the most expensive school in England, Millfield School in Somerset. My brother and I went there as boarders for the same fees as Bloxham. My father had lost his job, his marriage and his home. The effects of this full-scale family disaster were, for me at least, surprisingly benign. At thirteen it was the beginning of proper schooling and would set the foundation for much of my academic success. I would meet some extraordinary people and I would be given opportunities that money alone could not have bought. Millfield School was founded in 1935 by a Cambridge graduate and fanatical cricketer called Jack Meyer to educate the sons of Indian princes. His philosophy was simple. Children of the very rich could be accepted, however dim, and they would pay full fees. The rest of us would have to prove our usefulness to the school. The most outstanding sports players, such as the athlete Mary Bignall, who won three gold medals at the Tokyo Olympics, were given full scholarships. The sons of millionaires, who were there in some strength, were usually not at all bright. At my first evening meal, I was surprised to find that I was the only person at my table capable of cutting slices from a loaf of bread. The problem with sports stars was that they could make you feel inadequate. One of my friends was the tennis player Mark Cox, whom I would not dare to invite for a knock-up in the lunch hour. Brian Barnes, the golfer, was another friend who made me feel ball games were not for me. I was vice-captain of the rugby teams for the under-15s and under-16s. The captain, a genial guitar-playing fellow called Blacks, later turned into the celebrity disc jockey, Tony Blackburn. After 16, we were allowed to choose whether we played games. I chose golf and chess. My report said, Sergeant is sometimes seen leaning on a borrowed club in the vicinity of the golf course. But I did manage to become captain of chess. One of Jack Meyer's theories was that the only way people could learn properly was if they were allowed to find their own level. This was not possible in large classes, so at Millfield the average class size was about eight or ten. It made for intensive lessons. It required able teachers whose personalities became of crucial importance. I was fortunate in being taught English by Robert Bolt, who was to become one of the foremost playwrights in the country. My first piece of work was a pricing. I was describing how the war clouds of Europe were gathering, and being thirteen, thought the phrase had a certain ring about it. Not for Robert Bolt. It was a cliché and had to be struck out. When he was recovering from a stroke many years later, I wrote to commiserate and mention this incident. Perhaps he replied, I was a little harsh. During the time he taught me, he conquered the West End with a play called Flowering Cherry. We could tell he was doing well because he turned up for class in a brand new red estate car. Life at home in Oxford was very different from Great Tew. Instead of the large, beautiful vicarage, my mother had bought a post-war semi-detached house on an estate in Wolvercott. The adjustment was hard to make, but there were compensations. At the end of our road was the terminus for the number four bus route. It was the magic carpet to take us into Oxford. My mother was happy because there was a new man in her life who would become a most important mentor in mine. A well-known fellow of Maudlin College, C. Stevens, Tom to his close friends, was formidably clever. When we first met in Wolvercote, he took me to one side and asked me what I thought about the Van Allen radiation belt. It was a masterstroke. Like many schoolboys at the time, I was fascinated by the possibility of manned spaceflight. But Mr. Van Allen had discovered a belt of radiation circling the globe, and it was feared that this could make any manned spaceflight impossible. Unlike all the other grown-ups I came across, 
Tom, one of the country's experts in Roman Britain, seemed to share my concern. Our conversation launched a close friendship which lasted for the rest of Tom's life. Before long he came to live with us and became, in effect, my unofficial tutor. Although I was specialising in maths and physics, increasingly I was interested in politics and modern history. Tom became my guide. Two years later, he married my mother. I had decided to try to get into Magdalen College to do politics, philosophy and economics, but I would have to take the scholarship exam in maths and physics. One morning, with snow on the ground, I managed to do well in a paper on applied maths. I was awarded an alpha in that paper, and it was enough to tip the balance. My father, too, had found love. Soon after arriving at Millfield, he had befriended Edna Castles, a schoolhouse mother at Walton House. She had separated from her husband, and it was agreed that my father should take over his role as housemaster at Walton. In those unenlightened days, no one seemed to guess that they had become lovers. My father was so pleased I had got into Oxford. Well, he asked, what are you going to do before you start next autumn? I thought I would go to America, I replied. By 1963, travelling by ocean liner across the Atlantic was already a minority sport. Millions of people preferred to go by plane, and when I travelled on that marvellous ship, the Queen Elizabeth, in the spring of that year, it was the cheapest way to go to America. It had, for the fashionable, completely lost its glamour and seemed like a journey into the past. For me, of course, it was nothing of the kind. As I walked the gently heaving decks, one of the largest passenger ships ever built appeared to be taking me from one life to another. Childhood was fast receding in the giant ship's wake. Surely, I thought, when I reached New York, I will have to be taken for an adult. The arrival at New York was breathtaking. The skyscrapers of Manhattan seemed close enough to touch. The sky was a sharp blue. The yellow taxicabs buzzed about. There was even a band playing Dixie. There were some brisk goodbyes, and then I was on my own for the long journey south by train. I was staying with family friends Bob and Anne Hardy. Bob was to provide me with a job. He was soon to retire as a colonel in the American Air Force and had taken over a business making concrete blocks. And that is how, a few weeks before my 19th birthday, I became the accountant for a small concrete plant on Telegraph Road, Alexandria, which was on the verge of bankruptcy. I earned enough money to go to New York for a few weekends, and there I went to see the British satirical review Beyond the Fringe, which was playing on Broadway with the original cast. Alan Bennett, Peter Cook, Dudley Moore and Jonathan Miller were dressed in black pullovers and trousers and were being wonderfully funny. It all had an aura of magic. They made it look so simple, and it was also gloriously political. If anyone had told me that the next time I saw Alan Bennett, he would invite me to appear with him in a television comedy series, I would have been amazed. Back at the concrete plant, things were getting serious. The banks had decided to call in their loans. Even the electric typewriter was whisked away by an agent acting for the sheriff, and I was trying to use it at the time. My last task was to pay off the men, but remarkably the mood among the managers was not downcast. There was an extraordinary atmosphere of confidence at that time in America, and having John F. Kennedy in the White House seemed to foster that spirit. With his young wife and children, he gave the impression that his leadership could achieve all that was possible, and perhaps a bit more. After all we know now, this seems hopelessly naive. But for me it was another encouragement drawing me towards a political career. The demise of Commonwealth Carstone came fortunately late in my American trip. I had enough money to travel, and through an advertisement in the Washington Post, I came into contact with a young man from Argentina called Andres, and Anne, an English student. We were still living in an age of comparative innocence, so the idea of driving across America with two total strangers did not seem too odd or too dangerous. We drove a 1957 Chevrolet station wagon all the way to San Francisco and back. It was in the southern states that our travels took on a more sombre aspect. 
I was shocked at the visible signs of discrimination, with toilets and drinking fountains marked separately for blacks and whites. There was a great deal of despair among politically active blacks, but the tide was to turn that year largely due to the non-violent protests led by Martin Luther King. When I returned to Washington, I could not easily discuss my travels through the South with the Hardys. Anne Hardy was from Little Rock, Arkansas, and Bob came from Mississippi. They were not impressed by liberal anguish over black rights. Because in every other way I liked and admired them, I tried to avoid the subject. It was unfortunate that one of the most extraordinary political experiences of my life could not be shared with them. I was one of the small number of whites who were standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial when Martin Luther King made his I Have a Dream speech. For weeks we'd heard the build-up to what was called the March on Washington, and as I prepared to leave, Anne gave me a long, cool look. Well, Janie, she said, are you going downtown? Yes, I, I thought I would. I tried to sound casual. It was not that I knew this would be a great event. It was because I'd become caught up by what I saw as a simple injustice, and I was also about to be a full-time student of politics. At the rally there was a picnic atmosphere, with children eating hot dogs and their parents dressed like them in jeans. The parks police moved among the crowd, apparently more concerned with tidiness than imposing the law. The speeches were far too long. It was August, and although we had lined up on either side of the mirror-like lake, there was no respite from the heat, except among the trees further back. It was left to the great black singer Mahalia Jackson to rouse us with We Shall Overcome. Although we were convinced we would overcome, it still seemed a long way off. I had no idea who the last speaker would be, and even whether it would be worth waiting to hear him speak. I've often heard recordings of the I Have a Dream speech, but that is nothing compared with seeing the real thing. King was only 34 when he spoke in front of the Lincoln Memorial, but he was by far the most charismatic of the black leaders. Well-dressed in a smart suit, he had natural confidence. Above all, he had authority and presence, vital in the family business. King once said, Of course I was religious. My father is a preacher. My grandfather was a preacher. My great-grandfather was a preacher. My only brother is a preacher. My daddy's brother is a preacher. So I didn't have much choice. On that hot day in August, before the vast crowd, he used all that experience to good effect. As my father taught me, a good preacher never lets go the chance to bring together time and place. King began with a powerful line, standing in front of the statue of Abraham Lincoln, whose own commitment to black rights had led to the American Civil War. Five score years ago, King began, a great American, in whose symbolic shadow we stand, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of captivity. But one hundred years later, we must face the tragic fact that the Negro is still not free. As a 19-year-old, barely out of school, I was taken aback. The way he emphasized the words was unusually powerful. He almost sang the speech, leaving his audience in no doubt they were expected to respond. On the recordings, you can't hear the way the crowd took part. But when King began to repeat the refrain, I have a dream, they took it as a cue, punctuating King's speech with cries of, Oh, yeah, and Amen. He mentioned his dream of equality five times before saying with great feeling, I have a dream that one day my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Oh, yeah, those round me responded. Those in the trees on either side of the lake waved furiously in response. 
Finally and triumphantly, he ended with this. When we let freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, Free at last! Thank God Almighty, we are free at last! I wish I'd been with a companion. I remember walking away muttering to myself, that preacher was good. He was very good. He was very, very good. Like most teenagers, I was determined to stay cool. Adults might complain that this showed a lack of feeling, but the emotion was more complicated. I was thousands of miles from home and could not afford to be knocked off balance. Or at least, that's the way I felt. Within days, I was on my way back on the Queen Elizabeth to Southampton. I had not made my fortune in America, but having seen so much, I was now keen for a time to learn about politics and economics from books. Like many students before and since, I had two objectives, a good degree and a good degree of fun. I would divide my time between work and play, that is putting it too severely. There was far more play than work. After three years, I would end up with a second-class honours degree in politics, philosophy and economics, and a part in a major new comedy series on television. Oxford in the 1960s had a great reputation for student theatre. I was more interested in what can very loosely be called satire. My chance came when Harold Wilson went to number 10 with a suit, a pipe, a serious look and a Yorkshire accent, I quickly took advantage of the fact that no one else in Oxford seemed as keen as I was to make jokes at the new Prime Minister's expense. I finished one sketch in a cloud of tobacco smoke, musing on the fact that sometimes I went onto the roof of Number 10. When it rains, I get wet, I solemnly announced. But in the New Britain, when it rains, we'll all get wet. It was a sort of gritty nonsense that Wilson seemed very close to at times. On one occasion, Geoffrey Archer approached me and asked me whether I would like him to be my agent. He had already made his name by getting the Beatles and the American president, Lyndon Johnson, to help him raise a million pounds for Oxfam. I was puzzled by his suggestion. Why should I need an agent, I thought, when the most serious problem I have is whether I will do well enough in my final exams. I reminded him of the instant when he became deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. Yes, he said without hesitation, and if you'd accepted, you could have made a lot of money. It was obvious, even as students, that Geoffrey and I would take very different routes. My minor fame did not impress my widowed landlady, Mrs. Wright, who in my third year provided my lodgings off the Ifley Road. Mrs. W. had given her heart to her previous lodger, Michael Palin. Whatever joke we might have in her presence, it was not enough to recompense her for the loss of Mike. The year before, he had gone to seek fame as a comic actor. It was not really, I thought, an option for me. I tried to get into television, but was turned down by the BBC and ITN. I had better luck with the Reuters news agency. After written tests and a series of interviews, I was offered a graduate traineeship, and I was convinced the way was clear for me to become a journalist. My last great moment of student fun would be to appear in the Oxford Review at the Edinburgh Festival. We had a good team. Mick Sadler, Diana Quick, Nigel Rees, Alison Skilbeck, and Simon Brett. We were not very impressed by the play put on by Oxford students which preceded us. It had been written by a rather improbable character, who turned up in a military greatcoat and wasn't quite sure how it should end. For most of the run, it seemed a flop, and then one of the London reviewers declared it was the hit of the festival, and its young author never looked back. This was the world premiere of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead by a young chap called Tom Stoppard. Our review was standard fare. 
including sketches on a walking test instead of a driving test, and Simon Brett's five-minute version of King Lear. But Diana Quick was clearly a real actress in the making, and all the cast, except for me, seemed destined for a career in television or the theatre. Then, unknown to us, Alan Bennett arrived, and the next morning he asked to meet the entire cast in the pub. All of them ordered drinks of one kind or another. Alan and I had glasses of orange squash. Suddenly he turned to me and asked me whether I would be prepared to take part in a television comedy series he had written. Would it be possible, Alan asked, if I were to slip the script under your door this evening? Perhaps you could think about it. I explained how worried my parents would be. My father had set his heart on me receiving proper training with Reuters and then travelling the world in the way he would have enjoyed as a young man. My mother saw it differently. Oh, go on. You obviously want to say yes. And when I read the scripts, I knew that I could not be a Reuters trainee. There would be other times in my life when seriousness would prevail, but not this time. Those scripts were just too funny. End of Side 1 Side 2 Television comedy is a serious business. When I accepted Alan Bennett's offer, I had visions of the best part of student life, the silliest part, being carried on effortlessly in the outside world. It was a considerable shock to realise that for Alan and our fellow toilers in the BBC Joke Factory, comedy was far from being just a laugh. It wasn't long before my desire for frivolity came up against the implacable force of BBC discipline. I was blowing up a balloon during a run-through at Television Centre, an opportunity, it seemed, for a little improvisation. A worried glance at the balloon, followed by a short mime. This involved removing my finger, which had been clamped over the end, to prevent the balloon from being blown up, and when it was released, beaming in triumph. Not brilliant, but potentially quite funny, or so I thought. That was not the view of the director, Sidney Lotterby. He stormed out of the gallery and down the narrow metal staircase. Look, he said, all our jobs depend on one man, and that's him. He pointed to Alan Bennett, who was curled up in embarrassment on a studio settee. I did not think it wise to attempt a reply. Sitting in a former drill hall in Hammersmith and listening to Alan Bennett in rehearsal, it was his voice which was so peculiarly riveting. When playing a vicar or a colonel or another member of the establishment, he adopted a tortured expression. His eyes bulged, and yet the sound he produced was amazingly unforced. His intention was not to be weedy or ineffectual, but to be strong and daft at the same time. It was a style completely his own. The most flattering moment would come if Alan took out his black notebook. It was not clear if he was writing down what you said or merely making a note of something he had thought of. But the magpie effect was not misleading. His best work usually has an element of found poetry. He suggests that there is much more to everyday life than the rest of us can generally see, and his scripts always ring true. In one of my favourite sketches, I narrated a television profile of the archetypal northern writer. Alan began clearly. My father was a miner. My mother is a miner. He sums up by suggesting that what he has really tried to do over all the years is to take the pith out of reality. When I presented a tribute to Alan Bennett on Radio 4 more than 30 years later, the producer couldn't resist ending on that comment. It came after all sorts of worthies had compared Alan with great figures of the past, including Marcel Proust and even William Shakespeare. It brought the programme neatly down to earth, in a way I hoped he would appreciate. Alan Bennett was determinedly non-show business. He wasn't against it, it was just he did not see how he fitted in. He'd still not worked out his role in life. He did not want to be just another student comic, who had outstayed his welcome. On the margin won the Royal Television Society Award for the best television comedy of the year. But it was the only comedy series Alan ever wrote, and like me, 
he was in a serious quandary about what he should do next. My choices were limited. I worked briefly in an advertising agency, learning how important it was for there to be enough water in sausages so they would sizzle. At the BBC, there was an unofficial attempt to get me reconsidered as a trainee. But when my form, which had failed to elicit an interview, was re-examined, the door stayed firmly closed. I had committed the simple mistake of suggesting that I would be happy working in all sorts of BBC departments. Then, as now, applicants have to suggest that they are keen to be one particular cog in the machine and not appear to be overly impressed by the machine itself. Journalism seemed the only answer. I had an insatiable curiosity and a yearning for adventure. But I did not know any journalists. From a distance they seemed unprincipled. They would stop at nothing for a story. So when I set off for an interview with the Liverpool Daily Post and Echo, I was very apprehensive. The proprietor, Sir Alec Jeans, an unpopular figure, was unable to be present. It was a lucky stroke. Ian Park, his managing editor, had seen me in On the Margin and seemed impressed that I was prepared to forsake fame and fortune to settle in Liverpool as a junior trainee. He did not know, but I felt no such confidence. I was just desperate for a job. The final question came at last. Do you think you'll be able to talk to the dockers? Yes, I replied firmly, looking Mr. Park in the eye. I could hardly say no, and a few days later the letter of congratulations from the Liverpool Daily Post and Echo confirmed that he had taken me at my word. The American comedian W.C. Fields had a famous joke which told of the time he went to Baltimore. The day I went, it was closed. Liverpool, in the summer of 1967, had something of the same problem. The local council, in a desperate drive for modernity, was bulldozing vast sections of Liverpool to make way for high-rise blocks. They're doing what Hitler failed to do, was a common complaint, as row upon row of the terrace streets were mangled into rubble. I had arranged to live in a ground-floor room in a large Victorian house not far from the Enfield football ground. The rent was three pounds, quite a large part of my weekly wage of fourteen pounds. Included was heating supplied by a large gas fire, the use of a very small kitchen, and, if warning had been given, provision for a bath to be taken upstairs. My landlady, Mrs. Arnott, found it quite difficult to work out what I was doing in Liverpool. She regarded the Liverpool echo with some awe. The idea that I should be connected with the paper was not so easy to grasp. On the first night, very tentatively, she asked, Are your parents also members of the literary world? I hinted that the answer was yes. My real position was somewhat different. One of my first tasks on the paper was to detail the Merchant Navy exam results, hardly the work of a member of the literary world. The office where the reporters worked was like a schoolroom, with a bank of telephones in wooden cubicles at one end. For nearly a hundred years, the two papers had been produced in this building. Ancient linotype machines would assemble all the separate metal pieces, forming sentences and headlines, and these would be pressed into a mould. Metal cast from the mould would be put onto the mighty printing presses. The atmosphere was all too like a Victorian cotton mill, with ceramic jeans brilliantly cast as the tyrannical mill owner, and the trainees unfortunately thrust into the role of the undeserving poor. A week after I started, another trainee, Mary Smithies, arrived. She had studied classics at Cambridge. Thin and with long dark hair, she looked in many ways as if she would be the perfect entrant. She did not, though, make a good impression on the news editor. For a start, she wore miniskirts. A great deal has been written about the wave of change which we now call the Sixties, full of radical politics, sexual freedom and all that. But the effect was patchy, to say the least. True, the Beatles had come from Liverpool, but their influence seemed to increase the further you were from the city. Miniskirts, worn at work, 
were not a surefire success. I had also misunderstood some other parts of the 60s revolution. In the canteen, I made a point of not buying Mary a coffee. After all, weren't men and women meant to be equal? Would I expect her to pay for my coffee? But she thought this was an unfriendly move, and would always refer to me formally as Mr. Sergeant. We circled around each other rather warily. One Saturday afternoon she came across me at the delicatessen counter in the big Liverpool store called Cooper's. What are you doing? she asked me. Buying a, a yoghurt and a banana, I replied. It was only on reflection I realised that she might have meant, What are you doing tonight? It seemed an age later that we were talking in an animated fashion at the back of the typing class on a Saturday morning. This time I did not need to be prompted. And that afternoon we went together with a group of trainees to a barbecue on the beach at Blundell Sands. We certainly hit it off very quickly after a very slow start, though we had serious problems to overcome. Each year Sir Alec Jeans would take on around a dozen trainees, on the assumption that half of them would not last the course. After six months, Mary was out. It would be nearly a year before she could get back onto a proper career path by doing a postgraduate teaching course at Liverpool University. Before that, we lived together in Newsham Drive and could hardly have been happier, although I had to get used to the idea that at any point the axe could fall on me. Young journalists, to do well, have to produce readable copy which gets published. Sometimes, usually when no one else was about, a real story might come my way. But instead of being a vital chance to demonstrate my abilities, it all too often threw my lack of experience into vivid relief. Early one afternoon, we heard that a man had been killed in one of the small engineering factories not far from the city centre. I was immediately dispatched to find out what had happened. I arrived with a determined air and placed my notebook firmly on the desk. Well, I asked, so how did the man die? We're not saying anything, the manager announced. The whole matter will be dealt with by head office. My disappointment, which I did nothing to hide, failed to move him. Nor did my protestations that the last edition of the Liverpool Echo was only minutes away. While this conversation was taking place, the door behind me had opened and the chief reporter appeared. Don McKinley projected a mood of unhurried calm. I suppose you're not saying anything, he smiled sympathetically at the manager. I suppose you'd want head office to deal with this one. The manager nodded vigorously. What an awful business, Don paused, and looked out of the window at the pile of rubble in the centre of the plant, which I had failed to notice on my way in. Was that it? Uh, did the wall fall down? Yes, said the manager sadly. Oh dear, said Don. He couldn't have had a chance. The manager sighed. Not a chance. Been with the firm a long time, Don ventured. It was his first week in the job, the manager sighed again. This whole exchange lasted little more than a minute. Immediately we were outside, Don made a run for the nearby telephone box. He dictated the story straight to a copy taker. At no point had he used a notebook. It made the lead in the last edition of the Liverpool Echo. I was beginning to realise what it was like to be a reporter. My pay eventually rose to £27 a week, but money was tight. When the Beatles album, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, came out, I was not sure whether it made sense to buy a copy, but Mary was in no doubt. Just because we haven't got a record player, she said, it doesn't mean we can't buy the record. I would sometimes cite this remark as one of the reasons why I had to marry her. The ceremony took place on January the 4th, 1969, at the church in Mary's family home of Goosna near Preston. I did manage to improve as a general reporter. As the months went by, though, I longed for something more substantial. And a year after our marriage, I was thrown into a state of excitement by a BBC advertisement for national radio reporters based at Broadcasting House in London.
The day before the interview, our landlady took down a phone message requesting me to provide a three-minute script based on the previous day's news. Fearing that a serious piece would expose too many of my weaknesses, I wrote a humorous piece about a letter to the Times written by the headmaster of Eton. On arrival at Portland Place, I was immediately shown into a studio. A loudspeaker broke into life. Go ahead, in your own time. I managed to read my script without a mistake. The voice did not react. Come up to the fifth floor, it said. The editor of Radio News, Peter Woon, was sitting in the middle of the panel with his feet on the table. He looked at me in a fairly unfriendly way and said, We weren't really meant to be listening to the content. We wanted to hear your voice. But I thought your script was suitable for a school magazine. I looked him coldly in the eye. Yes, I said. It would go well in a school magazine. And at that, to my surprise, Peter Woon took his feet off the table and began to take a serious interest. But I still received a formal letter of rejection. Mary had fixed up a job in London teaching at Notting Hill and Ealing High School, and I was becoming increasingly worried. Then a letter arrived from the BBC saying Peter Woon would like to see me. What about being a producer, he suggested. I don't think I'd be very good at that. I had the impression that producers had clipboards and stopwatches and were very efficient. But wouldn't you like to work for the BBC in London, Peter persisted. Yes, it would be a good job in a warm office, but I want to be a reporter and I think I will try the Daily Mail. I had no idea that to the ex-Fleet Street reporter Peter Woon, all this was music to his ears. Eventually, four months after my original application, a letter from a BBC personnel officer arrived at Newsham Drive. Following your interview with the editor of Radio News, we would like to confirm that we are considering offering you a post as a radio reporter. If you accept this offer, I read it a hundred times. If you accept this offer, presumably meant that they were making me an offer. The hesitancy was apparently caused by the need to take up my references. When I left the BBC 30 years later, I was handed a copy of the reference Alan Bennett had written. He is a man of perception and intelligence, conscientious, hard-working and straightforward. He has an open and direct approach to people, together with an engaging manner, which would fit him very well for a post as news reporter. Last but not least, he has a good sense of humour, and I hope he gets the job. A plausible manner, some literary skill, and rat-like cunning were the qualities the journalist Nicholas Tomlin identified as the requirements for being a reporter. I was therefore expecting that very soon I would have to demonstrate these talents. But there was one quality required in my early days at Broadcasting House which was completely unexpected. You had to be ready to roll up the sleeve of your shirt at a moment's notice and be injected without protest. Reporters have to be ready without warning to be sent anywhere in the world, and this means they have to be protected from disease. All the vaccines for yellow fever, typhoid, cholera, and anything else they could think of were therefore injected into my arms as quickly as possible. For my first few weeks at the BBC, I went around in a bit of a daze. I discovered that the BBC was a world of its own. The impression was given that by joining, you'd signed up to an exclusive club, and as soon as you adapted to its rules and manners, the easier it would be. From now on, you would not go on holiday. You would go on leave. The Director General should be addressed as DG. With all other members of staff, only first names should be used. In official communications, though, anyone in authority was given an acronym. Sometimes these initials could be silly. The news editor of Radio Oxford had to put up with being called Nero. You were advised to drink beer with the editor of Radio News, but that was because he liked to drink at lunchtime. Early on, I was told to my surprise that I was not drinking enough. Senior members of staff did not give orders, they made suggestions. Do you think it would be a good idea if you did X? Usually had only one meaning. 
you will do X or there is going to be a great deal of trouble. As a reporter, I was provided with a car, a brand new Ford Escort with a two-way radio. But before I could drive it, I had to pass a BBC driving test. The one that I had passed in the conventional way was not deemed sufficient. It was as if nothing was regarded as normal unless it was special to the BBC. I was amused to learn that the corporation kept its own cow in Ealing, just in case a programme needed one in a hurry. I was also given a very grand Swiss-made wristwatch with BBC engraved on the back. It had a stopwatch facility to enable broadcast to be timed accurately and was worth some hundreds of pounds at today's prices. We are the only organisation, I was told with a smile, that makes sure that when you retire, you give them a watch. The personnel department did not think this was a laughing matter. When Frederick Forsyth, the novelist, decided suddenly to leave the staff and support the Nigerian state of Biafra in the Civil War, it caused enormous upset. There was concern that the impartiality of our radio services might be called into question. But in one of the small offices off the bleak corridors of Broadcasting House, Freddy Forsyth's administrative officer was worried about quite a different issue. He must see the importance of this, he fumed. We must get his watch back. I suffered from the usual problems that any new entrant might have to cope with, but also BBC News was going through one of its periodic upheavals. On this occasion, the change seemed particularly dramatic. The news bulletins on Radio 4 were going to include pieces written and spoken by reporters and correspondents. No longer would the newsreaders, who had included such great names as John Snag, be expected to read without interruption. Another change was a split between television and radio reporting. Instead of working for both, the staff would be split up into two camps. Inevitably, the best reporters, including Martin Bell, Keith Graves and Michael Sullivan, went to television. Those left on radio felt aggrieved. The advertisement for new radio reporters had attracted a wide field. Almost all those who got the job, including John Simpson, already worked inside the BBC. I was the only outsider to be given a staff post. It is not surprising that I should form an alliance and then a close friendship with John Simpson. Tall, languid as he was, I should have been frightened by his laid-back confidence, but he was so disarmingly self-deprecating. It was John Simpson who taught me the many nuances of BBC life. He had a theory that you could tell by the way members of senior management shaved whether their career was in decline. If a middle-aged man came into the office with small parts of his chin left unshaven, John would nudge me and nod vigorously. This was, he believed, the vital sign that the manager was in deep trouble. Haven't you noticed? Tufts. He's left tufts on his chin, he would say. The BBC quickly took over much of my life. From early morning until late at night, I would scurry back and forth to our flat off Baker Street. Even on days off, I would be absorbed with the programmes. From the very first day, I was in no doubt that this was the organisation I wanted to work for. The only serious reservation was whether I was good enough. There was a jaundiced old foreign news editor who struck me as the opposite of a role model. He would end his shift in the evening, after an hour in the pub, put on his brown felt hat and address the small number of sub-editors still at work in apocalyptic terms. All you lot, he would declaim, are waiting for something awful to happen. You're a bunch of ghouls. The only thing you like is tragedy. There's nothing so different as the world-weary journalist who has seen it all and the young ingenue desperate to see what the world has to offer. Junior television reporters had to put up with a running commentary from middle-aged cameramen, lighting men and sound men who could not resist pointing out that there was nothing new in the news business. If you were fortunate enough to be put in front of the camera, the effect of this middle-aged gang could be very intimidating. It was only later, working alongside other organisations, that I came to appreciate the vital ingredient in the BBC operation. If a fellow member of staff, 
said they would do something, invariably they would. If they had to be on location at five in the morning, they would be there. In any case, among broadcasters, timing is often close to being an obsession. You cannot say, here is the news at about six o'clock. With my fancy BBC watch, I soon learnt that seconds mattered, and if you were told your report should be a minute long, that meant 60 seconds, or 65 if you had the editor's permission. Sometimes 60 seconds seemed far too long. When a news story first breaks, the details can be skimpy. Perhaps there's been an explosion and the police are on the scene. Officially, no one knows what has happened, and it is not in the interests of those involved to speculate. Usually, the newsreader would introduce my reports with the phrase, Here's John Sargent, after he or she had outlined the basic facts. What I dreaded when the information was very limited was another introduction. With the details, John Sargent. It then became blindingly obvious to the listeners that I knew none of the details. One of these difficult stories came within weeks of my joining the BBC. On September the 6th, 1970, Arab terrorists attempted to hijack four international airliners. Two were forced to fly to Jordan, and one was taken to Cairo, where it was blown up the next day. The fourth airliner was an El Al jet, which arrived at Heathrow Airport after a terrorist had been killed on board by an Israeli security guard. The terrorist's female partner, Leila Khalid, was taken unhurt to Ealing Police Station. The radio car was soon parked in the Uxbridge Road, where it would remain for the next three weeks. John Simpson and I would take it in turns to bring the story to life, when all we could see was the blank modern frontage of the police station, and no sign, of course, of the glamorous Arab terrorist whose fate, it was believed, could affect the future of the Middle East. The new Prime Minister, Edward Heath, decided that hijackings should not be allowed to succeed, although the other governments involved, those in Switzerland and West Germany, were ready to compromise. The Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine announced that unless these governments freed six Palestinian prisoners and Britain released Leila Khalid, then the two planes held in Jordan would be blown up with all their passengers on board. Not surprisingly, in the radio car outside Ealing Police Station, we concentrated on the simple point that if we were close to Leila Khaled, we were close to one of the biggest news stories of our time. At any moment, we believed, she might be freed, and this would be a vital sign that the crisis was about to be resolved. Much as I enjoyed my role as a radio reporter, I was also keen to settle down domestically to my new life in London with Mary. After living in one room in Liverpool, we'd gone up in the world, to a fourth-floor flat in a rather grand Victorian mansion block just off Baker Street. The previous tenants had been called Constable, and, being sergeants, we thought this highly appropriate. The flat was called 4O Portman Mansions, and when I was ensconced in 4O on a Saturday evening, it has to be said my interest in news stories... Even the fate of the Middle East was not perhaps as sharp as it should have been. To be told on the phone that I would have to leave immediately and make my way to 10 Downing Street, where there would be a development in the Leila Khalid story, did not have the instant attraction that the news desk obviously hoped to inspire. But I did my best to stifle my irritation, so I would have to, in similar circumstances, for many years to come. It might seem fitting to report that my first visit to Number 10 filled me with awe and excitement, but it would not be true. At that stage, it was not my ambition to become a political correspondent. I was also rather disturbed that, even though I was not a lobby correspondent, it was necessary for me to attend this briefing, because it had not been possible to get hold of the BBC's duty political correspondent. The group of Westminster correspondents, often referred to as the lobby, were treated with great respect, to the dismay of ordinary reporters, who saw them as self-important and secretive. Much of their strength came from their contacts with the high and mighty at Westminster, sometimes gleaned in the lobby itself, the area just outside the chamber of the House of Commons. When I settled down at the back of my first lobby briefing on that Saturday evening, lobby members turned to stare at me in amazement. Good heavens, they seemed to be saying. An ordinary reporter. Who could he be? The Prime Minister's press secretary was Donald Maitland, 
He spoke with exaggerated precision in an upper-class voice. Unfortunately, the story he told was rather a long way from being a precise account of what was happening. Donald Maitland told us that the government had decided that it would be prepared to make a deal over Leila Khaled. They wanted this decision to be broadcast as soon as possible because earlier in the day our embassy in Amman had been threatened by a mob. This was given as the main reason for the change of heart. The only difficulty was that independent reports from Amman did not confirm the seriousness of the threat to our embassy. With hindsight, it's clear that much of what we said from the radio car in the Uxbridge Road was seriously misleading. It turns out that Leila Khalid, although appearing to be the ace in the pack, was in reality a busted flush. The Attorney General, Peter Rawlinson, had decided that she could not be held for long in police custody because she had not committed a crime under English law. The incident on the plane had taken place over international waters. I had learnt some of the dangers of broadcasting reports introduced by the apparently innocuous phrase, with the details, John Sargent. My caution about lobby briefings or any occasion when those in authority are overly anxious to put across their view remains to this day. One of the best definitions of news is the one that is sometimes attributed to the founder of the Daily Mail, Lord Northcliffe. News is something that someone somewhere wants to suppress. All the rest is advertising. Politicians are extremely careful to avoid being caught lying, but they are often guilty of the sin of omission. Not giving reporters the relevant information is one common ploy. Putting journalists off the scent by encouraging investigations into irrelevant matters is another. Governments often move slowly, if at all, to correct misleading impressions when they benefit from the false picture that has been created. This is the area where the most frequent battles take place between those in authority and those whose job it is to report what is really happening. Over the years that followed, I realised how interesting and exciting I found the struggle for information and the importance of seeing whose agenda you were following, your own or that of the government. Our coverage of the Leila Khalid story was hardly impressive. At least we had tried to find out what was going on. The experience also provided the basis for a useful counter-argument to those like the jaundiced foreign editor who accused us of simply waiting for tragedy. The official BBC reaction to my first months as a reporter was rather guarded. I was called in to see Peter Woon, and to my surprise, he formally handed me a letter. He deliberately ruined the effect by saying it was not as it seemed. When I read the letter from the Director of News and Current Affairs, I could see why he was worried. It was unqualified praise for my skills. Look, Peter said, this is just a letter saying you're OK. Don't believe a word of it. That was his way of keeping me up to the mark. It will be almost a year later before I knew that I'd been accepted as a reporter. It was then that I set off, with barely suppressed excitement, to fly to Belfast to cover the gathering storm in Northern Ireland. For those travelling on the plane from London, the standard joke was that as we were about to land at Belfast's Aldergrove Airport, the stewardess might warn us to put our watches back 300 years. It was hard for English reporters not to conclude that the Irish problem was a throwback to the 17th century. My feelings on arrival were usually a mixture of apprehension and excitement, masking a sinking realisation of how little I knew. When William Whitelaw became Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, he gave an impression of baffled decency when confronted with the complexities of Irish history. Once, when tempers were running particularly high, he stuffily declared, I don't think we should prejudge the past. Like his other comments, which became known as Willieisms, it could be considered wise or foolish, depending on your point of view. For many of us, it seemed to have the ring of common sense. On one of my first visits, Bernadette Devlin was also waiting at Gatwick for the Belfast plane, and I was determined to approach her, despite her fearsome reputation. She was even younger than me, but had already been elected an MP, with behind-the-scenes support from the IRA. I could not resist trying to get to know her. The departure lounge suddenly seemed rather hot 
I explained that I was a BBC reporter, new to Northern Ireland, anxious to understand, and I had one advantage. I have a hire car waiting for me. If you wanted to be driven anywhere, I could drive you. No, she said. I, I live in Cookstown. It's too far. I smiled and noted that my offer had not been completely rejected. When we landed at Aldgrove, I tried again. There's a car here, I said, just waiting to be used. With a sigh, she agreed, and again pointed out that it was a long drive to Cookstown. The longer the better, I thought. We bowled along for more than an hour, getting deeper and deeper into the dark countryside. Our conversation was not of the sort to lift the spirits. Bernadette had a tough, gritty voice and a relentless way of speaking, and when she referred to the Reverend Ian Paisley or other prominent unionists, it was as if a devil with horns had entered the story. Every now and then I chipped in with a question, but she understood her side of the deal was to provide an almost uninterrupted monologue, and I could hardly complain that she left so little room for optimism. When we arrived at Cookstown, I was invited into her home for a cup of tea. I'll say you're a friend, she said, but it might be better if you didn't say much. The atmosphere in the crowded front room was tense and uncomfortable, with me trying to look relaxed drinking tea, but believing every man who came in must be a member of the IRA. I smiled and nodded, but said absolutely nothing, and soon, with a sense of relief, climbed into the car and drove back to Belfast. My first big story came on the evening of the 5th of February, 1971. A group of journalists were prevented from crossing the road into the Catholic Ardoin area by military patrol. It was soon after midnight, and they had been rioting in some areas for much of the evening. Searches were being carried out for weapons, and the mood was ugly. We peered into the darkness, trying to work out what was happening. Then three shots rang out, and to my amazement, I could see that one of the local BBC reporters, David Capper, had recorded the sound. A young Catholic had been killed by one of those shots. The army said they'd returned fire with a group of men who had been shooting from the shadows. Soon afterwards, in another part of our doin, a second Catholic man was shot dead by troops. Some distance away in the New Lodge Road area, Protestant and Catholic crowds had gathered, and soon after one o'clock, burning cars were turned into a barricade. A machine gun on the Catholic side opened up on an army patrol, and all five soldiers were hit. One of them, gunner Robert Curtis, was killed. He was the first British soldier to die on active service in Northern Ireland for nearly 50 years. The next morning, my story led all the radio bulletins. It included the recording of the three shots, and it marked a historic turning point. From then on, the army's involvement in Northern Ireland was no longer seen as an attempt to keep the peace. It would take on many of the aspects of a full-blooded war. One evening I was going back to the Europa Hotel when I saw an army sergeant wandering apparently aimlessly in the road outside. What are you doing? I asked him, in the unembarrassed way reporters usually behaved with soldiers in Northern Ireland. Oh, I'm uh, just looking for a bomb, sir. Uh, there's been a warning. I briefly joined him in the search, anxious to dispel any impression that I was scared. We walked past a big red letterbox, and then he went on his way, and I turned into the hotel. Almost immediately there was an enormous explosion. I rushed outside and saw that the army sergeant had also returned to the scene. We looked at each other with surprise and bewilderment. The pavement where we had been standing moments before was now covered with large pieces of cast iron. It was all that remained of the big red letterbox. There is no doubt but had we delayed for even a minute, we would have been killed. Back in London, there were times when I toyed with the idea of refusing any further assignments to Belfast. But I would then think about the BBC Northern Ireland Orchestra. The idea that they would be struggling into rehearsals in Belfast with a cello or a tuba, as I was deciding that it was all too dangerous, could somehow not be contemplated. Many of the people in Northern Ireland and some of their politicians were an engaging lot, with a directness and humour which often lit up the darkest scene. 
I remember Jerry Fitt, the MP for West Belfast, showing off the gun he'd been given for his own protection. As Jerry waved his gun at me, explaining that he didn't know how to shoot, it was impossible to keep a straight face. We often seemed to laugh because taking it seriously would be far too difficult. A master in the art of tension-relieving humour was John Simpson. We worked together in Londonderry, which he rightly considered one of the great Georgian cities of the British Isles. One day there was a serious incident outside the city hotel. Just as I had parked our hire car, a new Hillman Avenger, a young man wrenched open the driver's door and forced me into the middle of the car, shouting, Don't move, I'll blast your head off. John remained remarkably cool, despite being pushed against the side of the passenger seat, while trapped between the two front seats, I was terrified. The young man drove at breakneck speed into the Catholic bog side, then shouted at us to leave. John asked if we could take our tape recorders from the car boot. This we were allowed to do, and then we walked disconsolately back to the hotel, reluctant to mention what was on our minds. Finally, we had to admit the awful truth. The man had not been armed. We had lost a brand new car simply because a man had shouted and pointed his thumb at us. Mary was amazingly forbearing about my trips to Belfast. She worried, of course, about the danger, but she realised how much the reporting life meant to me and knew that I had found my vocation. I've been listening to a selection of my reports kept in the BBC archives. It has not been an easy task. My memories tend to be of companionship mixed with tension and excitement, and it was in Belfast that I came of age as a reporter. But the archive tells a story of unfolding tragedy, and I must not shrink from that. Here is part of my live report the day after the explosion at McGurk's Bar in December 1971. Fifteen people were killed. I went to the scene a short time ago, and sad groups of people are still staring at the rubble. There's nothing to show that a pub was ever there. It's as if a corner of the street has been ripped away. A man told me his son of 14 was killed in the blast. The boy was upstairs and didn't stand a chance. After my experiences in Belfast, I dreamed of being a foreign correspondent, of wearing tropical suits and drinking in seedy bars, of over-tipping waiters and bringing down governments. Like a lot of journalists, I had been influenced by Evelyn Waugh's novel, Scoop. It's a brilliant satire on the absurdities of reporting from far away with little knowledge and no responsibility. In the spring of 1972, flying high above the Atlantic in a chartered Britannia plane, I felt just like a character from one of Waugh's novels. It had all started the day before with a dramatic message from the Ministry of Defence saying they had flown out a bomb disposal team to search for explosives on board the QE2, which had left New York two days earlier. A man had phoned the company to say that bombs on board would go off unless he was given $350,000. Our task was simple, to find the QE2 and make sure that 2,000 passengers and crew were safe. It was soon after 7.30 a.m. when we swooped out of the clouds, and there before us, shining in the morning light, was the magnificent QE2, apparently unharmed. I was sitting in the cockpit behind the captain, and we managed to get in touch with the radio operator on board. He quickly agreed to link me up by radio telephone to the BBC in London. There were only a few minutes to go before the 8 o'clock news. I scribbled a few words, and then, shouting above the noise of the engines, delivered my verdict. We're now circling the QE2, and if one wasn't aware of the dramatic events of the past two days, it'd be easy to say, what's the fuss about? The QE2 is steaming confidently, the smoke from her funnel, and apparently no difficulty on board. We heard about an hour ago there'd be no broadcast from the liner itself, which leaves me to send this one message clearly back. The QE2 is on the high seas and is perfectly all right. It was only when I got back to the office that I realised what an impact this had made. I was treated like a returning hero. The man who tried to blackmail Cunard was eventually arrested, 
and the events were turned into a Hollywood film. I was given the reward I really craved. It was decided that I should go to Vietnam. End of side two.